Hey everybody! Okay, so here's your first uh, mini lecture for chapters 5 and 6 prior to your discussion board question. Now, chapter 5 goes over Greece. We started talking about Greece prior to this break, an extended break, and then we're going into Rome. There are a couple things I want you to think about as you read these two chapters. You might have already started reading chapter 5, which is great. Maybe you took advantage and you're reading chapter 6. That's great. If not, no worries. Over the course of next week, this coming week, you have chapters 5 and 6 to read over. Now, with regards to Greece, Greece gives us a concept of philosophy. Philosophy is reason. It's cause and effect. It's, it is taking into consideration that the gods do not have total control over us as human beings and that, in fact, we have control over our lives. Therefore, if you speed, you get a ticket. That's not the gods made you speed and therefore giving you a ticket. You tr made that choice to speed and therefore the ramifications, the effect could be that you get a ticket. So that is a very big deal, and we see that for the very first time, that separation of the gods having total control over humanity and humans having control over themselves, which then leads to the concept of democracy, which is human beings, therefore, have a voice in how their governance is. Uh, to get from the concept of philosophy to the concept of governance, taking care of yourself, there's a lot in between that it's hard to go over in a short mini lecture. But just suffice it to say that in the time period that we get the concepts of around uh, 600 BCE, concepts of cause and effect and human beings have control over their life to 450 BCE, which is really the height of Greece and Athenian democracy, principles of democracy, um, what's really happening is that um, there are leaders that come into play in Athens that create something called the rule of law, meaning Instead of personal vengeance, families fighting other families like the Sopranos or, you know, mobsters, you know, revenge killings, we have where uh, the law, if someone gets murdered, that, that event, that homicide is taken out of the hands of the families and put into the civil authorities. This is a very big deal because it's making a change from having human emotion driving action to reason and um, a rule uh, of law, uh, laws that cover and govern how we behave and how justice will be meted. Very big deal. So uh, in that process, we develop this concept of having a voice. And in Athens, the new governance called democracy uh, is created. Now it's in Athens by a guy named Cleisthenes. Now this is a pretty big deal because the concept is that every adult male, not women, um, are able to vote and most of them are landholders but we also see merchants. We see the beginning where you don't have to be a landholder in order to vote. But every person has a vote and this becomes very very problematic because it becomes mob rule. So the majority always wins and the minority voice is never heard. This is problematic and quite honestly it is the reason why our founders in the United States didn't use a, d a direct democracy to create our government. So, and, and it fails. It absolutely fails in Greece. Uh, in Athens is where it's really practiced. Uh, the only person who could hold it together was a guy named Pericles. And he's in your textbook, he's in your readings. Pericles is very important. 
And an interesting thing about Pericles is that in a time where, remember we talked about Athenian men don't like women, they think women cannot be sexually satiated, that women cannot be controlled, and that women therefore cannot be equal to men, um, and you don't love a woman because why would you love a woman? She's not equal to a man. Pericles, the only guy who could really hold together a democracy had a wife who he loved, and that was a very big deal. And he was able to keep the Athenian democracy going, and then he died um, of uh, illness, and when, that, when he died, it fell totally apart. And part of the reason why it fell apart, and one of the reasons why it's not a good way to govern, is that people, every single person has a vote. But do every... Does every person have the knowledge and understanding of what's at stake within their vote? This is a very big deal. So in our world today, let's say we're talking right now, we're at home, we're doing what we need to do, and the conversation is coming up more and more about government health care. Should there be a one um, should the government, federal government, uh, have uh, all health care in the country? Well, some people might say, yes, that's a really great idea. But it's not that simple. What about all the people who currently work for, um, for health care institutions? All the people who work for the insurance companies goes all the way down. How do the payment system now, it goes to place to place to place. If it goes, it starts only doing going directly from the government to the to people or directly from the government to the doctors, all those people in between are going to lose their jobs. So how do we deal with that? So there's a lot more at stake than just this ideal, like I don't ever want to have to worry about health care. So regardless of how you feel about that issue, there's a lot of ramifications for making a huge change. Well, not everybody understands those ramifications. And, and when they vote, if you vote only on what your gut is or what the ideal is at the end, then you're not taking into consideration the middle ground. And, and in the end, it, it, democracy totally fails in Greece. Now, um, but it's an important thing to understand as we're going forward. Now, when um, Greece really falls, when Sparta and Athens fight each other in the Peloponnesian Wars, you'll read about this in your textbook, Spartans think the Athenians are getting too strong, and so they make, wage war on the Athenians. And, um, and at the end, quite honestly, at the end, they both are so weak. Sparta wins. But they're so weak, both of them, that it, it, they become vulnerable for attack. And that's exactly what happens. A guy named King Philip of Macedon from Macedonia, which is still exists today, this country, and it's at the top of the, the peninsula of Greece, the Peloponnesus, he gets in and he actually starts taking his, his uh, troops and he comes down and he... He takes over Athens and the Greece, the Peloponnesus, because he's able to, because they're all so weakened by this Peloponnesian War that they're easily conquered. And when he does that, um, he he doesn't lose, he doesn't take away from the uh, Hellenistic ideas and characteristics and principles, but um, he takes over the peninsula. And then he dies. And who takes over but his son, Alexander. And Alexander is young, and he, but he gets his generals together, and he has five generals all together. One of them's name is Ptolemy, and one of them's name is Seleucus. Now, why is this important? Because what Alexander does with his generals is he really creates an empire. And he goes out into, uh, he goes all the way to India, he goes into Africa, he goes through, obviously, if he's, he, if he's expanding out, he's, he's uh, going, so he's Macedonia, all the way over to India, so it would be this way, and then he goes down into Egypt. And it's a huge, huge empire. And what he does there is super, super unique and why we would call him Alexander the Great. And that is that he gets people 
And in the rural communities, in the outskirts of, of, of small settlements, and he builds cities. And then he says to all the people in the rural communities, hey, come on in, because we're going to give it in this city, you're going to be able to have a voice in your governance. So it's a, it's a democracy that he brings to them, but more than democracy on a very small scale, he get, brings to the world of this Mediterranean world, to India and down into Africa, the concept. This is a big deal, big, big, big deal, which is you people, you people, you have a voice in governance. You have a voice in how you want to live your life and a voice in how you are going to, whether you're going to be taxed or not, or what your city is going to look like, or if you're going to have education centers or whatever. You have a voice in this. And this, this was ginormous. It was huge. So he does this. He goes all the way around and, and he's got this huge empire and he brings people together under the auspices of you have a voice. So we see cities pop up all over. Now, Alexander the Great, um, was an interesting character, a uh, couple of things. Number one, he was really bisexual, and most people don't want to really talk about that. But I think it's a very important point, because when we now in the modern world have arguments in the American army and Navy, military, and around the world about whether people who are gay should or should not be part of the military, it's a crock, man. It's a total crock. The greatest general in the history of the world, the whole ancient world is divided between pre-Alexander and post-Alexander, was bisexual. So, any notions that you have that sexuality defines a person should be, forget it. It doesn't. It does not at all. Any preconceived notions, it does not at all. A human being is a human being is a human being. Intelligence is not defined by who you love. De de intelligence de is defined by your intelligence, and that's it. So that's the reason why I mentioned Alexander the Great. There are a lot of people in history who have tried to skirt that away, but I don't want to do that because we live in a very diverse world and we should own that diversity and we should revel in that diversity. It's a good thing. So now Alexander the Great, though, dies unexpectedly at the age of 33. And when he dies, he, he's, he's unexpected, and he's, the generals come to him and say, so who's going to be in charge? And he says, the better of you will be in charge. Well, then he dies. He's got five generals, and what they basically do is they split up the empire. And two guys are most important, and one of them is Ptolemy, P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, Ptolemy. Ptolemy is said to have taken Alexander the Great's body and brought it down to Egypt and buried it somewhere. Nobody knows where it is, even now. And then there's a guy named Seleucus, and he takes over. He's from India all the way to what is modern-day Israel in the Middle East. Now, Israel, remember, modern-day Israel is the connector between Africa and uh, Asia and Europe. And so it's always fought over. It's the only, you know, land uh, connection between these continents. So Seleucus fights over it, and then Ptolemy fights over it, and Seleucus fights over it, and Ptolemy fights over it, and they go back and forth and back and forth. And eventually, um, it, that argument, Seleucus eventually takes over, but, uh, but then we see the rise of uh, the Maccabeans, which are uh, Ju the Jewish uh, state, begins to what is formed um, after their battle with Seleucus, um, and that's where we get the celebration of Hanukkah from a historical event like that. Now, um, uh, so that now while that's happening, this fight over uh, Israel between Seleucus and Ptolemies are going on during the rise of the Roman Empire. So first there's Rome, and please read about Romulus and Remus in the beginning of Rome, and then we have the 
the Romans, who are the Latins, they begin to expand out. Now, the first way that they expand out is by raping the women in nearby villages. Yep, it's true. So they go out and they rape the women. And then, so that the men, the family members don't kill them for raping their women, they marry their women and by default become family. And you're not gonna kill your family, you make it honorable. But in that process of doing it, now the Latins have expanded out. And that's the first way they expand out. Though it is not the common way they expand out, but I think that's important. Um, that it's pretty brutal, it's pretty horrible. Now they begin to expand up the, the Italian peninsula north and then they go over to Greece. And eventually the Roman Empire is is created. Now it goes from kings um, to um, a, a republic. And how does it do that? Well, one of the last kings of the of Rome um, uh, takes advantage of a woman named Lucretia, and um, and uh, she ends up getting ki he gets killed. She takes her life, even though her family kills this guy and uh, the king, and, um, and the advisors to the kings, there were five kings, and the advisors to the five kings were called the Senate. And that's where we get the Senate from. They were the wealthy, wealthy landowners and family of the king, and, and those people were called the senators. And so now the Senate is the ruling body, and the Senate, those senators, are representatives of the people. It's a representational government. And that is how we get a republic, quote unquote, a republic. A republic is a representational government. Over time, that republic fails. And the republic fails because of two reasons. One is because it becomes so self-absorbed in their wealth, because they're wealthy landowners, that they mistreat the army. And there's one story about the mistreatment of the army that's important. So the, in order to be in the Roman army, um, you had to be a landowner. And to be a land, and, and, and so if you are a landowner and you're in the Roman army, you're gone for years at a time. And then when you come back, sometimes if you're not married already, your land de degrades. And some of these dudes could not, there was one company of guys who could not keep the land. You know, they didn't have any money to really rework the land. So they ended up having to sell the land. And that, they couldn't go back in the army. So they went to the Senate because they needed a living. And they're already um, professional soldiers of Rome. And they go to the Senate and they say, hey, if we fight for you, will you give us land back? And the Senate said, yeah, sure. We're going to send you out on a new mission. And when you come back, those of you who are alive, we're going to give you land back. Well, they did it. They came back. And lo and behold, the Senate says, oops, um, my bad. Did I actually say that? And so one of the senators by the name of Marius, he says to those guys, that, that group of guys, hey, look, if you fight for me, I, I will sorry I will um, put together I, I will um, I will pay you and I will give you land back and so that's what he did and that was the beginning of the army following a person we fast forward to the first triumvirate a guy named um, Crassus uh, no Croesus, a guy named um, Pompey, and Julius Caesar. And um, they all become the head of the, the Republic. And, um, and Crassus was not a, uh, he was not a, um, uh, he was a wealthy, wealthy dude, but he didn't have any experience in military. And so he went out to get fame and fortune. He bought himself a military, bought himself an army, and then they, he dies. 
Um, Pompey and Julius Caesar were very close friends. As a matter of fact, Julius Caesar married Pompey's daughter, and they didn't always like each other, but they respected each other. And Julius Caesar, um, uh, Pompey stayed home while Julius, Julius Caesar captured more ground for the Roman Empire in France and Gaul, and then came back a hero. Yeah, 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 I love you, Julius Caesar. And so Pompey said, well, I'm going to go into Egypt, and I'm going to try and get more land there. But the Egyptian prince, Cleopatra's brother, Queen Cleopatra that we have all these things about, she, he kills Pompey. And he thinks that he's going to be all cool and groovy um, by giving um, Julius Caesar the head of Pompey, Julius Caesar, of course, very peeved about all this. And, um, and Julius Caesar really ends up, he's the last man standing, and he takes on the mantle of being the first emperor. And from there, we have a second triumvirate, which a guy named Octavius, who's this scrawny little guy who's the nephew of Julius Caesar, actually takes over. And then the, now we begin the era of the emperors. Um, over time, the, the empire moves, because it's so far east, the empire moves to Constantinople. It creates a, the Emperor Constantine moves to Constantinople, and now we see the decline of the Western Roman Empire. And the Bishop of Rome, who is the Pope, becomes not only the leader of the religion, but is also leader of governance. And so from the from Italy all the way to France and Spain, we begin the descent of the medieval world. In, in the Eastern Empire, we begin the Byzantine Empire, which is the late Roman period. And this is where we see the rise of Christianity. Christianity becomes legalized in 312 AD, and we get our first Christmas uh, after the Nicene Council in 325 AD. And, um, and there are a lot of issues that go along with that too. Um, but going, but that's what we, so the Byzantine Empire is really the late Roman Empire. And that goes on until, um, and Constantinople, which is the center of, of the Byzantine um, Empire, uh, is a three-walled city, and it remains a Christian city until 1452 and Islam, and the Islamic conquest. But um, what's important to remember is we have Greece, democracy, Rome, and we have um, the Republic, and it becomes an empire, and then it, cr it crumbles under its own weight and the empire becomes no longer, but we have uh, the the um, all of the all of the trading, all the goods of the old Roman Empire remain the same, um, and uh, and now we but we call it the Byzantine Empire because it's the rise of Christianity and Christianity in Europe. So. Um, uh, I want you, in the question I'm going to pose in this discussion board, I want you to take all this into consideration, and I want you to think about the movement of what it was in Greece, this concept of a voice in governance, a power over yourself, how that changes in the Roman Empire, and then how that goes, uh, how that uh, is it, how that looks under the Byzantine Empire, okay? Um, do people still have a voice in their governance, uh, or has Christianity taken over that voice? How has the rise of the church influenced government? Um, because as we go forward, we're going to see in the mid Middle Ages, uh, is the is Christianity above, does it have more power than the king's? Or do the kings have more power than Christianity? And with that, I leave you. I hope you um, are you do you enjoy your reading. And uh, if you need me, just give me a shout. Okay, see you later. Bye.